scripture is full of prophecy regarding the plagues that will be poured out upon the world in the last days prior to the second coming. A couple of years ago, I released a video that discussed these last day's plagues and showed how the same plagues we will see prior to second coming are identical to those that happened in Egypt with Moses and Aaron. We are all familiar with Moses and Aaron coming to the court of Pharaoh demanding that he let the children of Israel out of bondage. The displays of power on both sides and the ensuing plagues that were released upon the Egyptians until Pharaoh finally released the children of Israel. The ten plagues as they came to be known were 1. Water turning to blood, 2. The frogs, 3. The gnats, 4. The flies, 5. The death of the livestock, 6. Boils, 7. Fire and hail, 8. Locusts, 9. Darkness, and finally the death of the firstborn was the tenth. What I illustrated in that other video is that each of these plagues will happen again prior to the second coming. For example, Revelation 8 verse 8 says that prior to the second coming, a second angel will sound a trump and a third part of the seas become blood. Revelation 16 gives more details about this, but each of these plagues is repeated prior to the second coming. It can be difficult to spot because these references are found in different books of scripture, but each of these are repeated prior to the second coming, and when reading them, they appear to extend to far greater regions than just what Egypt was, and some seem to be nearly worldwide. Doctrine and Covenants 89 is all about the word of wisdom, but there is a big clue in verse 21 we need to examine. It says, And I, the Lord God, give unto them a promise that the destroying angel shall pass by them as the children of Israel and not slay them. Amen. This verse is clearly referring to the tenth plague of Egypt when the destroying angel passed over the children of Israel and didn't slay them. The term destroying angel is not found anywhere else in the scriptures except here in Doctrine and Covenants 89, which ties the final plague of Egypt to the events that are prophesied to happen in the last days prior to the second coming, because by living the word of wisdom, we will be protected from the destroying angel, the same angel that took the lives of the firstborn in Egypt. And it isn't just the plagues of Egypt that are types and shadows of things to come. Moses and Aaron were the two witnesses before Pharaoh. Similarly, there will be two witnesses in the last days that bring about the plagues prior to Christ's second coming, which it talks about in Revelation 11. Pop culture never ceases to amaze me with depictions of these two witnesses. But in Revelation 11, 3-5, it says, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days, clothed in sackcloth. That is the three and a half years. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before God on the earth. Those that are confused by that should read Zechariah chapter 4. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out from their mouths and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. So to understand these final plagues and the destroying angel, we need to understand the two witnesses. Revelation makes it clear that just prior to the coming of Jesus Christ, there will be two witnesses performing miracles in Jerusalem and no one will be able to harm them. Some might say that the 42 months or three and a half years is symbolic or has alternate meaning with numerology, and that very well may be. Anything is possible. But for this video, I'm going to treat it as a literal three and a half years. I did an entire video on the two witnesses, which really needs to be understood if you want to get a better understanding of the events prior to the second coming. And I promise I didn't use any of these pop culture pictures in that one, but these are certainly fun. But what I do in that other video is speculate on who the two witnesses may be. In a video released about the same time as this one, I actually talk about a mirroring of events that is also happening in Zion at the same time, which is also very interesting. So it is important to understand that I'm not just coming up with some association between the ten plagues of Egypt with Moses and Aaron as two witnesses and similar things happening in the last days. Revelation 11.6 tells us, These have power to shut heaven, and it rained not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over the waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. It calls out turning water to blood and smiting the earth with all manner of plagues. This is also why we know there needs to be a massive famine before the second coming. But it also talks about this in modern day scripture as well. Dr. Covenants 84 verse 97 says that in the last days, plagues shall go forth and they shall not be taken from the earth until I have completed my work. 
Doctrine and Covenants 43.25 calls out many of the plagues and calamities of the last days just prior to the second coming. After the three and a half year period, the two witnesses will be killed and their bodies displayed in Jerusalem by those that overcome them and they will celebrate for three and a half days. After this, the two witnesses will be resurrected, as it states in Revelation 11, 7 through 11. On my interactive last days timeline, I do not try to guess the date of the second coming, but what I do is attempt to identify the remaining events that have to happen and place them in order. You can have access to this timeline as well. I'll post the link here. You can drill down into each of these events and get more and more information on each one. Remember, this is not meant to predict the second coming timing, just an analysis of the events that need to happen as Christ himself says, watch and pray. Many find a study of the second coming fascinating as I do, but it doesn't have to be scary or confusing. There are so many resources available to learn from people far smarter than I am on this and many other subjects. That is why I built the Gospel Learning app. Download and use it for free. Now, those of you that want the extra credit for learning more about these plagues, let's go into a bit more depth. I did a video a while back on this, and I illustrate how a singular event can cause a chain reaction of events to cause the 10 plagues. That video had a lot of audio quality problems, being one of the earliest videos I did. So I'm going to quickly summarize all of that here. Just know that it, there's a lot more information on it in that other video. While we don't know the exact date of the Exodus, it is believed to be about 3,600 years ago, approximately 16th century BC. We also don't know if that year experienced a drought of any kind, but considering the events to follow, it would seem likely, especially considering that the same precursor described in the book of Revelation matches similar events that will unfold prior to the second coming. During the 16th century BC, 500 miles northwest of the Nile Delta in the Greek Isle of Santorini, there was a volcanic eruption. This volcanic eruption has been hypothesized for years as the cause of the 10 plagues and is even the subject of a BBC documentary. Could a volcanic eruption lead to the 10 plagues of Egypt? To be clear, I didn't make up this theory, but I do think it's very interesting. I'll put a link to the BBC video entitled Moses here where you can learn more about this. Santorini was blown apart by a gigantic volcanic eruption that was thousands of times more powerful than a nuclear weapon. It was one of the biggest explosions in the last 10,000 years. The ash cloud from the Santorini blast would have been huge and far-reaching. Could the effects of this eruption have reached as far as Egypt? When Santorini erupted, the wind was blowing in a southeasterly direction towards Egypt. Samples of Santorini ash have been collected from the seabed, the heaviest concentration being in the direct direction of the Nile Delta. Oceanographer Dr. Daniel Stanley went to the Delta to drill for samples of mud and silt to see if the ash could have reached Egypt. He found volcanic shards that could be firmly related to that explosion. But what would have been the effects, especially if Egypt was experiencing a drought at that time? Let's look at each of the ten plagues one by one. The first is the river turns to blood. While this sounds extraordinary, and it truly is, it isn't unheard of. Beginning in 1991, a similar phenomenon occurred in North Carolina in the Pamilco Sound, where the rivers literally turned to blood and all of the fish died. While it took several years for science to figure it out, it turns out that an organism called Fisteria physicida, the second word meaning fish killer, research has shown both toxins being released as well as direct feeding on the fish. Fisteria is benign until the right conditions are met, specifically shallow, poorly flushed, polluted, in other words, nutrient-rich, water with a high concentration of fish. The Fisteria attacked the fish, causing lesions, hemorrhaging, and then death. The estimated number of dead fish exceeded 1 billion across a 66-square-mile area over the next six years. Nutrient-rich as a result of the volcanic ash combined with a drought, and perhaps even if it wasn't a drought, would be the perfect conditions for Fisteria to turn the Nile River to blood. The second plague was frogs. A frog partially breathes through its skin. However, this becomes a problem under the conditions mentioned above. The fisteria blood and toxicity of the water would force frogs from the Nile and surrounding areas to leave and begin looking for other water sources. Within a few days, frogs would die and begin to decompose. 
Lice is mentioned as the third plague. While the King James Version translates it as lice, most other biblical translations say gnats. This would make more sense because it is clear from verse 17 that both man and beast were affected and there are no strains of lice that live on both humans as well as animals. Additionally, decomposing frogs and even more so fish would result in gnats or small flying insects. The fourth plague is flies. Rotting fish and frogs would naturally cause swarms of flies within a couple of days. There are many species of biting flies that can carry various diseases. Notice it says the land was corrupted by reason of the swarm of flies. Sanitation was no longer possible, no clean water, no major food source. Fish was gone and everything was being infected by diseased flies. This is where a major promise is made that most people overlook. The Lord promised to spare those living in Goshen, where the Israelites lived. As you can see here, Goshen is significantly south of where the plagues took place. Where the Israelites were living, they were not affected by the plagues. There were no flies which we can derive, and there were no frogs or dead fish nearby. This becomes an important detail as we continue this narrative. The fifth plague is the death of Egyptian livestock. The diseased flies have now bitten and infected the livestock of the Egyptians while the Israelite animals are left healthy. The livestock die off. Water contaminated, although it might be clearing up by this time. No fish, no livestock. This only leaves grains as the remaining food source for the Egyptians. Next comes boils. The infection from the flies impacted the animals first, but then also caused boils to come upon the Egyptians. Boils are caused by germs that enter the body through small nicks or cuts. This could have been the bites of the flies or resulting from scratching the skin when the flies were swarming. Again, Pharaoh hardens his heart and the Lord makes a promise. In Exodus 9.15 it says, For now I will stretch out mine hand that I might smite thee and thy people with pestilence and thou shalt be cut off from the earth. Pestilence is defined as a fatal epidemic disease. Bubonic plague is one of these types of plagues caused by bacterium Yasesina. One to seven days exposure to the bacteria, flu-like symptoms develop. These symptoms include fever, headache, and vomiting. Swollen and painful lymph nodes occur in the areas closest to where the bacteria entered the skin. Bubonic plague is mainly spread by infected fleas from small animals. It may also result from exposure to the body fluids from a dead plague-infected animal. The seventh plague is fire and hail. This is where some believe God's use of natural law breaks down. However, if we go back to the cause of the very first plague being caused by an erupting volcano, hail, fire, lightning, and thunder do occur all at the same time. This would have burned the fields, destroyed any grains and plants they were growing. It even destroyed the trees with any fruit. Now there is no fish, animals, grains, fruit, or vegetables. The grains that were just harvested or about to be harvested were lost. Whether this is a second eruption of a volcano, more likely in my opinion, or the effects of the first eruption, we just don't know. Next is the plague of locusts. The fires and storms that brought the hail could be the same force that drives the locusts out of the deserts of Egypt. This would be especially true if it were during a drought. The locusts devour any and all remaining food in the land. Next is the plague of darkness. This is probably more evidence of the second eruption as well, but to put the magnitude of the Santorini eruption into perspective, in recorded history, this is one of the largest four volcanic eruptions in the history of the world. It was larger than 40 atomic bombs and approximately 100 times more powerful than Pompeii. It was so large and blew out so much material that it created a gigantic crater that remains today. This would have caused darkness in many parts of the world for several days as the debris blotted out the sun and ash fell from the sky. Then the final plague, the death of the Egyptian firstborn. There have been many people who have connected the dots between the first nine plagues with the volcanic eruption as I have described here but it has been difficult for those to tie in the final plague of the killing of the firstborn. I offer here some possible explanations, although perhaps it was just a destroying angel taking a sword from house to house. But it is possible that it could be tied in with the natural events of the other plagues. 
One explanation is social. For example, remembering the food source had been wiped out, the Egyptians could have been starving. Did the Egyptians turn to their rotten, spoiled meat to stay alive? Were the Egyptian firstborns those that would test food for the rest of the family or have priority over the food? Due to the threat of Moses, did the firstborn males come together for protection and eat something that killed them? Were the firstborn those that handled the diseased animals infecting them with the plague? Were all the firstborn put somewhere to stay safe and instead something happened to that location? There are simply not enough details in the scriptures to know for sure, but there are certainly enough plausible ways that this could have happened that I feel certain it was through natural causes. Although I'm perfectly fine if it is just an angel going from house to house. God usually works through natural means, but not always. It certainly seems that most, if not all, of the ten plagues of Egypt were no exception, as they could have all been from the volcanic eruption that we know occurred right around this time. But to go back to where we started with this video, how do we protect ourselves from these plagues in the last day? Doctrine and Covenants 97 says that if we are to escape them, we must observe to do the things whatsoever the Lord commands us. And if we don't, we will have plagues come down upon us. But look at Doctrine and Covenants 89 verse 21. This is the final promise in the word of wisdom, that the destroying angel shall pass by them as the children of Israel and not slay them. I take that to mean that by being true and faithful to his commandments, and for whatever reason, the word of wisdom specifically, we will be protected from these coming plagues, and more specifically, the final one that destroys the wicked entirely and ushers in Christ's millennial reign. I hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.